weekends are a good time to journey to Camp Crystal Meth. Unless the weekend begins with Friday the 13th. Because 13 is an unlucky number. Especially when that's the number of voices in your head. <laughs> Luck has run out for these 10 mental outpatients as they've been prescribed two heaping spoonfuls of death. Because these are Johan's Woods. And he'll run you right out of them. Count death three in two D. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Pekovic, and this is episode number 196. Available now on demand is Camp Death 3 in 2D, a parody of the Friday the 13th film series, most notably Friday the 13th Part 3 in 3D, a suitably silly and absurd spoof on all things slasher movie, Camp Death 3 in 2D is recommended viewing for horror fans who want to see the franchise that gave us Jason parodied to brutal effects. Joining me now to talk about Camp Death 3 in 2D is the film's director, Matt Thrain. Matt, I thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. So, as I mentioned in the intro, this is very much a parody of the Friday the 13th film series specifically the third entry of the um, in the franchise. Now, the third entry is very notable for two things. Number one, it was in 3D. So, you know, before all these Avatar stuff and all that, 3D stuff has been around for ages. It came, came, it's come and gone. But in the 80s, around this time, a lot of the horror films especially were, were using this technique. And the other thing about that movie was that that was the first time that the Jason Voorhees character had, like, the mask and such. It was kind of like a, a pivotal part of, like, the slasher kind of canon what was it specific about that film, however, that you wanted to parry, parody that movie specifically out of all the Friday the 13 films? I think there's like maybe 10 or 12 of them. Um, why that one, Matt? It's my favorite. Yeah, it's my favorite movie of all of them. It's, uh, and I think I have this theory that the first Friday the 13th that you ever see is, is typically your favorite. I mean, I know a lot of people who who actually, you know love uh, Jason Goes to Manhattan or Jason Takes Manhattan, even though it's not a very good film. And it, the reason why is because it's the first one that they saw. So when I was a kid, I was probably about uh, about 11 at the time when – maybe I was about 10 when Part 3 came out. And I just remember seeing the uh, the newspaper advertisements with the sort of 3D-looking um, picture of Jason sort of stabbing through the shower curtain. And, and, and my sister, who's a bit older than me, she saw it before I did, and she told me all these stories about how – how there were eyeballs going into the screen, and there were like snakes on on wires, and and uh, I just was fascinated by that. So when I had a chance to actually watch it, probably in 1984, I had a chance to watch it on video. Um, it was just like you know, I was very young too, so it was uh, it was like hidden fruit or forbidden fruit. I was not allowed to actually watch it because I was so young. It just was something that had an, uh, an impact on me. And uh, to this day, I still go back to that, even though I, I think there are better movies in the series. It's this, this is just sort of my wet blanket uh, Friday the 13th movie, even the look of it. I, I, something about the, the lighting, I know it looks a bit soft because of the, the 3D um, camera that they were using. And, and, you know, it's, and for the most part, it's not really that great of a film, but something I, I still I love and I can't explain other than saying that it's something that I, uh, I just was so happy to see when I was a kid and uh, to be able to have a chance to, to make fun of, of it and, and other parts of the series too was a bit of a dream come true for me. So now it's going to lead on to my next question because whenever I see a movie that's a spoof of something of a genre or specific type of movie, I always question whether this is done out of love or hate. But this is very much something done out of love uh, on your part. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, people can debate the the quality of the of the comedy, and of course, it's you know, if the if you're sense of humor is not within the lane of, of this film, you're going to hate it. And that's something we, we've kind of come to expect by now. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the passion, I mean, I think that my love for doing it really helped me, you know, at, least, at least for the, the source material, really helped me to, to finish the film because it was really, really difficult, the, the, the problems we had over the course of filming. And, and so I think that if it, was, if it was done for a more cynical reason, if the, if the reasoning for doing it was cynical, I was doing it just to try to cash in on something, I don't think I would have finished it. But because of the fact that I had a, a great love for the series, um, it just helped me to uh, to finish. I was looking at the history of the production. So you guys were actually filming back in 2014, is that correct? 
<laughs> we started them. We started in September of 2014. Um, all the stuff that you see in the movie that is where there's the camp um, set, that was done at a <clears throat> excuse me at a camp called uh, Camp Miriam on Gabriel Island, which is uh, about two ferry rides from Vancouver, Canada, where I'm from. And so we shot probably about 40 percent of the movie there. Um, and then we took a few months off uh, to wait for the springtime to come, and then we finished the movie off in the spring and summer and actually in, into the winter of 2015. And then at that point, it took another another two years, really, for me to uh, to get my act together to finish it off and, and in a way that I felt was, was, was good enough because um, there was a lot of things, a lot of the effects stuff. And I did all that stuff myself. And, I mean, although I am an editor by, by training – um, the effects stuff, and, and I'm the first to admit that the effects are pretty ropey at times, but I still needed to learn how to do a lot of that stuff. So it just took a long, long time in post-production to finish it off. So yeah, it's been, it'll be five years actually um, in June. Five years in June from the first time that I began to cast the movie to it being 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 finished. So yeah. When I was watching the film, I very much know what I'm watching. I know it's a spoof, and I know that with regards to spoof and parodies, you take um, the conventional and you just take it right up to 11. It's supposed to be over the top and such. Um, when I was watching your film in particular, I was, I, I was really wanting the question, is this also a film that's response to maybe an up yours to our very PC times that we're living in right now? I wish I could say yes because I, I mean that would be a great statement to make, <clears throat> but uh, it's not because I mean again because we started in 2014. This is this is pre-Trump, this is pre-Me Too, this is pre all, all that sort of stuff. I think the last since Trump has been in office, that's when people have become hyper hyper sensitive and 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 hyper triggered. So um, it just happened to be that because of all the delays that this really un PC movie has happened to to be delivered in the midst of this uh, very uh, very strange cultural time. So no, I, I wish that was the case, but it wasn't. It was just a, uh, it was at the time. I, I look back at it now. I think, well, you know, if I was to start the movie now, knowing what was happening in the culture, would I have made the same movie? And it would be no, absolutely not, because I would be worried probably about about the response. But because of the fact that uh, it was done at a separate time from all that, and also our intentions at the time, and and continue to be. Um, good. We we know who our audience is, and we're targeting them. And we also understand too that people who do not fall within the parameters of that audience are probably going to hate it and get triggered by it. We've had a lot of people who who are upset by it, and it's never a nice thing to hear that. But at the same time, we know we know exactly what we were trying to achieve. And and uh, so yeah, no, it's a good question. It's it's an interesting it's an interesting time to release a movie that is this um, offensive. <laughs> Um, the center itself, like for a slasher film to kind of succeed, a killer needs to have the playground. You talked about the camp that you found and you call it in your film camp, crystal meth spelt M E P H. Um, so it's yeah. a rehabilitation center for the criminally insane. And I think like a lot of these kind of little gags in the film really do show, uh, the love that you have for the genre. Cause usually if you have, if you love a genre, do you know about the little things in the little rules that it has? And the slasher films have a lot of them. Um, one thing that the Friday the Thirteenth series has above all the other ones is the unconventional ways that its main uh, antagonist dispenses of his victims, and it's something you have fun with in your movie. I think this is the first time I've ever seen a film of like a death by toaster, uh, <laughs> where the toaster wasn't thrown in a bathtub, for example. Like this is like, you know, uh, something very unique there. When it came to drawing up these different scenarios and different ways of like killing off your characters, I think there must have been like 90 deaths in this film. Uh, yeah. Around that number, 80 to 90. Um, did you have fun putting this sort of stuff together? Was there stuff that you didn't uh, get a chance to shoot that you wanted to shoot? Um, give me some examples of that. Well, it's interesting. As the movie went further and further into production and delays and whatnot, the, the kills actually became more and more surreal. And, and the movie became more and more surreal. I think a, a lot of that was reflected in, in the upheaval during the filming process. And so the crazier that the, the process became, the crazier the movie became. And I also, I think at that point, too, we began to realize, or at least I began to realize, that what we were making could be – misconstrued as being something that was a thumb in the eye to people. And we, I wanted to make it so surreal and so stupid that there'd be nobody who could take it seriously. So, for example, the the death in with the Australian girl who gets killed by a cocaine-snorting squirrel, originally that was just going to be her getting a, a flare in the face. And at the time, which is very reminiscent of Part 
five, I think it was, the, one of the biker guy gets a, a – the greaser guys gets a, a flare in, in the face. Um, but it was too costly and too difficult to, to make up a mock-up head. And, and I happened to find where my car is parked – there's a dumpster there and there was two massive 50 pound bags of flour. I thought, well, I could use that for my movie for something. How would I use that? And I realized I have a, a leaf blower. Why don't we, why don't we incorporate, say that as cocaine and have a, a squirrel be snorting the cocaine and snort it onto this poor Aussie girl and have her die. So, um, after a while, you know, it became, there were so many, there's so many issues regarding the film and trying to plug narrative holes and that it became creativity by necessity really. And, and that's, the toaster thing was like, you know, I had very little money. We knew I had, I mean, I knew I, we had to kill star Lisa as the actor. And then the name of the character is Georgia in the forest. The next day it was like, okay, what can I find at the local, um, salvation army type of store, like a thrift store for under five bucks that I could kill her with. That would be kind of interesting and surreal. So I was just walking up and down the aisles, looking at things and little knickknacks and this and this. And I came across a toaster and thought, well, that's, that's ridiculous because toasters aren't sharp enough to decapitate somebody with. So let's let's go with that. So yeah, it was. I mean, I have to admit that a lot of the the, the real creative stuff came out of just necessity and and just being having our backs to the wall and having you know a, a creative problem and finding a way to be able to solve that. So I would love to say that, that a lot of that stuff was was done in the script, but it wasn't. That was, a lot of that was was going along the way because we had actors quit. And we had to find ways to be able to plug that narrative hole, and so yeah, it was. Uh, it's it's a very interesting way to make a movie. It's it's uh, filmmaking by by utter chaos. I don't recommend it, but uh, it certainly makes for an interesting final product. Interesting thing that I looked up on on the IMDb. There are over tw- over twenty screenwriters listed, and majority of the, these people are the cast. Was this a film that was improvised uh, during filming? Are you now credited for dialogue and for such. A little bit, yeah. Um, what had happened was that I cast the, the the folks, and then we workshopped the characters for about f- three or four months. We we meet every every Sunday, and we do seven or eight hours of improv just to be able to get them to flesh out the characters. And because of the fact that they once they were given their characters, they began to just run with them themselves, and to be able to develop them and, and add little things that I would never have um, suggested or, or even thought of. And so that's really why they all got a story credit was because they, they created the characters that were there. Um, the vast majority of the stuff that you see on, on, on camera is stuff that was scripted that I wrote in the script. But there are, there are bits and pieces of, of um, improv as well. One of the things I like to do is because is, I, I know from my own experience as being an actor that sometimes the way that a writer writes the dialogue doesn't, just doesn't work for your brain. You can't process it, so it comes out sounding unnatural and so i would just say look you you know what the character needs to say in this in this particular scene say it say you hit the points you need to hit but just make sure that uh, you do it in your own in your own way because it'll, it'll sound more natural so um and for those reasons and for a little bits of pieces of uh, of improv along the way i gave everybody a um um a, a story credit but for the most part it was all from a script that i had written Okay, that's cool. I was really just curious about in regards to that because there was such a high number of uh, people there. But that's really cool that you did that because I don't think a lot of filmmakers uh, would because, of course, during any movie, um, actors bring in their own kind of uh, interpretations of stuff, but yet not get credited. credited. So good on you for in regards to that. Um, there's an Australian connection in regards to this film. There is. Um, Emma yeah. Docker, um, who plays the part of Amy Henderson. It's kind of like... Uh, the stock kind of nymphomaniac, uh, nymphomaniac kind of character uh, within these kind of films. How did you go about to cast uh, Emma in the film? She came in for an audition. I, I remember her. She was. I was auditioning somebody before her, and she was in the uh, in the lobby area. And I just I remember her laughing this this huge massive laugh. And she came in and was this this larger than life character. And and she's incredibly tall, very beautiful, and just was a, a, a breath of fresh air. And so. Um, she's been living in Vancouver now for I think at least four or five years, at least five years, and so she was able to do the, the sort of the American and uh, Canadian accent no problem at all. And she actually rehearsed it or, or um, did the audition in that sort of North American accent. And I think we decided probably within the first after she was um, cast, we, we decided within the first couple of weeks that she should go with the Australian thing and we should sort of work that into the script. And I think that that just allowed her to to. Be, I, th- I think I would imagine. I mean, I don't know, but that if you're an actor who is 
having to put on an accent, you're probably going to be a lot more cognizant of that than anything else while you're acting. And so it might deflect from, you know, effort you could be putting into the physical stuff or the facial stuff. And so I figured, you know, let's just have her be an Australian and have her go off the, off the chain and just be as, as crazy as she can be. And so she was, uh, yeah, she was, a, she was such a trooper. I mean, you can imagine having two 50-pound bags of flour be, <laughs> be shot at you via a very, very powerful leaf blower in the middle of the forest. And she was maybe uh, two meters away from the table we had this stuff on. And she had we we had plugged her nose and her ears with um, with with cotton or something like that just to be able to to make sure that she didn't have the stuff go into her system. But you can imagine how how uh, <laughs> how how difficult that would be, and and uh, you have to be a real trooper to be able to withstand that kind of low budget filmmaking. So yeah, no, she was just a joy to work with. I worked with her um, in another film as well. She did uh, a drama scene or drama whole. The whole thing was a drama, and she was phenomenal there too. So she's just a phenomenal talent across the board. I just wanted to uh, ask a bit of uh, horror trivia with you uh, in regards to one of your minor characters in the film. So you sure. have a groundskeeper by the name of Cropsy in your film. Yourself, uh, okay. it's, it's cra- sorry, it's Crapsy, not Cropsy. But like a riff on that kind of uh, on that kind of name. Yeah, yeah. So yourself being Canadian and uh, the the character of Cropsy uh, featuring in the very popular um, can, uh, Canadian film The Burning that came out in the early eighties, was that a tribute to that by any chance? It was. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, in, in prep for the for uh, um, for writing the film, I watched all the Fridays and I watched a bunch of other ones, like you know, all the Sleepaway Camp movies and of course um, uh, The Burning as well. So yeah, that was definitely a uh, uh, a tribute to that. And uh, you know, I, I, the character who plays that is Sean Bordoff, who is one of the producers as well. And I just thought it would be a perfect thing for him to be. Um, sort of this strange, uh, you know, mentally retarded groundskeeper, and and so yeah, that definitely is a a nod to the burning. It's a great film. That's so underrated. I think many people have seen it um, uh, in the world. So it's good to you gave a little tribute to it in your film. Um, I want to talk about the kind of like innovative ways you've gone about marketing the film. A recent kind of thing you did was you watched uh, Camp Death uh, Three for fifty two hours straight. Um, So my question to you is, what was that experience like? And number two, when you watch your own film so many times in a row, what do you learn from the experience as a filmmaker? I mean, I know that the creating this film brought a lot of different experiences for you, special effects, etc. What do you? What's the ultimate thing that you take away from that experience? Oh boy. Um, Well, the reason why is because you know the thing is, you know, nowadays I think traditional crowdfunding campaigns don't necessarily work unless you do something crazy and this is the, the second time i've done something pretty abnormal for the for the <laughs> for the benefit of the film the first thing was actually the um the the uh, i did something called the the coconut walk the coconut walk was a 24 hour nonstop walk around the local high school um track with a coconut chain to my waist and again it wasn't something that i wanted to do but it was you know at that point our crowdfunding campaign had collected maybe a thousand dollars and we were looking at sixteen thousand dollars to raise and if something wasn't done we would not have been able to make the movie so it was like okay i sort of felt like i needed to step up and, and did that and it worked um i mean i totally I totally killed my left knee. It still continues to give me troubles to this day. But uh, you know, we we raised the sixteen thousand bucks from doing that, and then and then yeah, again we did another crowdfunding campaign this past December, um, which was just a regular one, saying you know we want to raise a thousand dollars to help with the advertising costs, and you know tip people just didn't they weren't on board really, so it was like oh okay I have to do another one of these crazy stunts because they work. There's something. There's something mesmerizing and, and interesting about a middle-aged man hurting himself, you know, <laughs> alive for all to see, and, and it makes people want to to watch it and to give their money. So yeah, that's that's I you know these things I do I don't like to do them, and they definitely take a, a toll on my body. But um, you know I, I, I'm pretty motivated and, and ambitious when it comes to trying to get the film out there, so I, I'll, I'll do it. But in terms of the 52-hour thing, yeah, it was it, – you know what? Again, comparatively speaking to um, doing the, the Coconut Walk, which was 50 – no, sorry. That was 24 hours straight, but that was 70 miles and 112 kilometers, I think, in total. Wow. Um, sitting down and watching my own movie for, for a couple of days was, was really, really no big deal at all. It was, it was actually pretty easy. Um, 
in terms of what I saw differently, I, th- I think what happened was after probably the, oh God, I don't know, the the 10th or 15th time, the film, you stop looking at it from a critical technical eye. Because, you know, being that you edited everything, you're seeing every single cut as it happens and, and you're sort of beginning to see it as just a piece of work. And um, and I was pretty pleased with the way that it flowed. I mean, there's, you know, the, the film is not a masterpiece by any stretch. I think it's really well made. Um, obviously, it's it's going to be um, offensive to a lot of people, but um, I think that uh, ha- having the opportunity to see it for just for what it is was was kind of fun, and it also gave me a chance because what was happening was cast and crew were calling in and they were kind of watching it with me and sort of reminiscing about things and doing sort of a running commentary. So it was it was it was not that difficult, and it was actually a lot of fun to reconnect with people I hadn't seen and talked to for for you know years so yeah it was overall it was it was uh compared to the coconut walk it was it was a breeze it kind of sounded like a film premiere but just done on a loop for a very long time yeah that's a good way of, of putting it it was you know it, it worked out really well it, it did you know it was again these things are not something that i i prefer to do and uh even even promotion in general i, I don't mind doing stuff um like this is this is great but i, I think just uh I would much prefer to have um, the film kind of organically grow a following, but I recognize that's not going to happen unless I really push it. So it, it, it was successful in that regard. We definitely got a lot more people um, paying attention to the film. The one thing about horror movies, slasher films especially, is there's always a potential for a sequel. Even when you think the story is finished, another one pops up and it just resurrects itself. When it comes to Camp Death 3... Is there a possibility of maybe a Camp Death 4, maybe going backwards looking at Chapters 1 and 2? I mean, uh, I mean, can that be a possibility, or are you done with the Camp Death uh, experiment? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not done. I'm not done at all. But, I, you know, the question is whether or not there's any, any appetite for it. I think that um, given the experience that this was, I mean, I think I recognize that, that uh, if we're going to do another one, we, we need to... Um, take more time and, and that's going to take more money so it's it's difficult to know if there's going to be a demand for it but I've been thinking a lot now in the last couple of weeks actually about just skipping four entirely mm-hmm. and just going and going to five and then five being entirely in space where all the characters are on a spaceship kind of going towards a black hole and, and there's no explanation as to how they got there and they make references to things that happened in part four that would have ex- would explain why they're on a spaceship but they don't actually go into detail that kind of thing. I, I just like the idea of doing a space opera, but again, that's going to be pretty pricey to be able to, to find, you know, a location and sets to do that. But um, yeah, you know, I, I have lots of ideas. I, I honestly don't know what the next chapter is going to be, but um, you know, fingers are crossed that we'll have a chance to to make another one of these because you know, again, this one was done. It was done quick. It was done dirty. It was done under under a, a, a surreal amount of chaos and, and turmoil. And um, and it just it it uh, it's not as tight as as I would want to make a movie. And I know that given the talent of the cast that we have, and if we have enough time and we have you know a bit of a budget, we could really make something extraordinary. Um, so that's really my main motivation was is to go and say you know what this is this is pretty good, but we can do something that is that is out of this world. Um, no pun intended, because obviously if we go into space. We'll, won't be on this planet, but uh, yeah. So I, I don't. The answer to that is I don't quite know. I hope so, but um, you know, the next uh, the next year or so will tell because you know we're, we're beginning to gather some steam. We're seeing it in the numbers for Amazon Prime. We're seeing it in the numbers on the on the Facebook page, and so. But whether or not there's going to be enough of a demand, I, I don't know. So before anyone is waiting for a sequel, go watch the original right now, Camp Death 3 into the available on-demand Amazon Prime. I imagine that would be the best way to go for everyone to check this film out. Yeah, I mean, unless you're living – well, you know what? In Australia and right now, Amazon Prime is just the US and the UK, but we are going to be on Prime probably within the next uh, 20 to 30 days. So if you live in Australia, if you live in New Zealand, you know places like that, or Canada for that matter, um, you'll need to wait. All or you can go to Vimeo um, on demand; it's there right now as well, mm-hmm. and it's also available. It's going to be available on on Troma now. Troma now is the is the streaming service by Troma, who did uh, the Toxic Avenger and did uh, Sergeant Kabuki Man. We got onto that, and we got onto it a couple other ones too, Binge Horror and and some other streaming service. So it, it is definitely out there. 
Um, just Google it and, and uh, you know, uh, you'll find it. And if you don't find it and you want to watch it on Vimeo On Demand but you don't have the money to pay for it, just contact me directly and I'll give you a promo code and you can watch it for free. Because for me, I just want people to see it at this point. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you, Matt? Would that be through a Facebook page? Uh, yeah, you go to the, the Camp Death 3 Facebook page and just uh, just message me directly and say that uh, you say you're broke. You live in, in one of the countries or you're broke or you don't have Prime and uh, – You'd like to check it out, and you know, in exchange for like a you know a review on on Amazon, I mean, be as honest as you want to. I mean, you know, we are actually embracing the negative reviews as well, so you're you're free to to slam it if you hate it. Um, I'm happy to provide you with a promo code. So there you are, everyone. Camp Death Three in 2D. Make sure you check out the film. Horror fans, especially who like to see their favorite uh, slasher films parodied, uh, beyond comprehension, and that's what you're going to get here, Matt Frame. <laughs> I right, thank you very much for joining me today. Congratulations, movie, and hopefully uh, much success comes your way uh, so we can see another adventure of Crapsy and his victims, hopefully in space sometime <laughs> in the future. Thank you so much, Matthew. Appreciate it.